This is a Casio IF8000, a device I wager you've never heard of, unless you are David, who so kindly sent this to me. I've been waiting to talk about this for years, but finding the right way to provide context has been a challenge, because this unassuming little device from 1987 is the first device to have a portable touchscreen. But I know some people will probably contest that, so let's go over what the IF8000 is, what its predecessors aren't, and why this device is essentially the progenitor of modern smartphones. In the 1980s, consumer electronics were miniaturizing and becoming portable. Computers were becoming more common and it was inevitable that you would eventually take a computer with you everywhere. But not yet. The truly portable devices of the 80s weren't really able to match the flexibility of general purpose computers and were usually trying to fill a specific niche. So instead of carrying around something like a TRS-80 pocket computer, you would more likely have pocket dictionaries, auto dialers, calculators, and other single function devices. This is where the advent of PDAs comes in to merge and simplify some of these for you. They were a personal data assistant after all. Many devices came out that would fit this category, but I want to look at three devices in particular that were gunning for the top billing in the late 80s. The Scion Organizer 2, Sharp Wizard, and our little Casio here. Now, I want to take the Scion Organizer out of this lineup because it's kind of a different beast. It's more like the pocket computer and had a powerful ecosystem of expansions and could be used for general programmable computation. It was the best device, but did so by being more barbaric and requiring a lot of patience and learning. Its data pack expansions were just raw EEPROMs that needed a UV eraser, for example. This leaves us with the two classic PDAs. The Sharp Wizard is a pocket database capable of holding contact info, notes, and can have its functionality expanded with slot-in cartridges. These cartridges are why I want to start with this device. They slide behind a clear window that has touch sensors on it that allow the cartridges to add additional buttons to the device. This is the exact same technology as a touchscreen, but there isn't a display behind it, and the touch cells are very large. And this is where I'm going to draw a contentious line. I'm going to call this type of device a touch element device, and Sharp wasn't the first to implement one of these. This is a Casio PF8000 from 1983, the ancestor to the IF8000 I promise we'll get back to. It has a much more impressive touch element than the Sharp that also uses large cells, but is meant for you to draw letters on as a form of data entry. You write in data on one side while watching the input on the other. 1983 is also the same year that HP would launch the HP 150 touchscreen PC, so having this in your pocket is very impressive. This is clearly not a touchscreen, though, because the touch element isn't over the display. Which brings me to this, the 1984 Casio AT550. This is a wristwatch with a small digit display above the standard rotating hand timepiece. But it also has a touch grid over the entire watch crystal. This is used to input numbers and operators to use it as a calculator. Unlike the PF8000 though, the touch element technically does overlap with the display. It just also overlaps all of the surface that is not the display. This watch is sometimes cited as the first portable touchscreen device, but it is just reusing the technology from the PF8000 and the actual touch area over the display is just a few cells. But I think more critically, like the PF8000, if the display of the AT550 wasn't under the touch cells, its usability wouldn't change at all. There is no relation between the display and the touch sensors. It's merely an input mechanism. And this stayed true for all portable devices until the release of the IF8000. Casio released the IF8000 as a digital diary. It was meant for note-taking, storing contacts, and keeping your schedule in like other PDAs of the time. It also used touch to input data, but unlike the devices before it, each pixel in the display has its own touch cell directly above it. This is used to create menus, navigate through dates, and arbitrarily draw notes on the screen. No other portable device before this had direct correlation between the touch elements and the display like this, making this truly the first touch screen device. Is it good? Of course not. The screen is tiny and just typing text gets you way more information density. The Sharp and Scion cost almost twice as much and still curb stomped this thing in value because they were actually practical to use. But is it cool? Oh yeah. 
I want to go over how the IF-8000 works, but I've got one more tangent to go on first about it, the wizard, and also this FX-451M and HP-28. You see, folding electronics aren't a new thing. Back in the 80s, they were doing it, but since flexible displays obviously weren't a thing yet, it was just to add more buttons. For the devices excluding the wizard, there are less commonly used buttons, which lets you fold the cover behind it to make it smaller to hold. The wizard had to use the cover buttons, though, because they have the card slot with buttons under the display. This makes it slightly awkward to use, and later models would use a similar layout, but in landscape orientation to solve this. Casio's implementation in their devices is a bit more clever, because it's intended to look like a leather case that was common for calculators of this time. The buttons connect through a flexible PCB going into the case and are just direct membrane switches. But this was still a pretty slick setup, and it's easily the best looking device of its contemporaries. Alright, now we can take a closer look at the IF-8000, but don't get too excited because it's kind of a one-trick pony with the touchscreen. Its main face buttons are for its calculator mode. This is not a graphing calculator, and it's barely more than a four-function calculator. The most exciting calculator feature it has is just percentage. It does also have square root, memory, and constant modes, but that's it. And worse is that despite its relatively large and high-resolution 96 by 64 pixel display, it will only show a single number on screen at a time. That FX451 from earlier puts this to shame, boasting 132 functions according to its ads. The IF8000 also does not have a clock, and there is no provision for storing the date or time. All settings does is let you recalibrate the touch matrix. I can't help but wonder if Casio didn't give it these features to avoid it hurting the sales of their other devices. Now the IF8000 really only has three other modes in the calculator, a phone book, memo pad, and calendar. The calendar can just also be viewed as a schedule. In all modes, the buttons in the cover serve as a keyboard for inputting data. It also has two modifier keys, Shift, which is for the actions and modes, and Alpha Symbol for changing the characters the keyboard inputs. Let's start with Notes, because everything else builds on that. Drawing is done with a plastic stylus. This is a single point resistive touch sensor over the display, like many others of this time. You are able to draw with two different line thicknesses, switching with a button on the cover. The drawing is one to one per pixel, which is what makes this device so special. It works well, but the area is fairly small. You can kind of expand it by using the arrow buttons to add new pages next to the one you're drawing on, but you can't smoothly pan between them to have a contiguous drawing. Each page can also contain entered text by moving the cursor position around and starting to type. You are able to store up to 50 pages according to the manual, and each document is available from the memo list. The other two main modes are the contacts and calendars. Each entry in these can also contain a drawing on top of the usual data associated with them, and I'm not really sure why. The manual has a few examples of useful reasons to do this, like adding maps to schedules and just, oh boy, am I so excited to have to completely redraw a map from scratch every time I go somewhere new. But even they were phoning it in with these things, like the name of the contact in huge print or where they were located, which is just a waste of storage space. There are a few more complicated options, like the ability to tag contacts and search by that, but it doesn't really get much more advanced than that. This device really only has one thing going for it with the touchscreen. By contrast, the Sharp Wizard had different software packs, a PC connection interface for exchanging notes and updating contacts, portable printers for making instant hard copies of things, and much more. It's in a whole other league of functionality, and you got all of those options for only $250 compared to $180 for the IF8000. It's kind of a no-brainer that the IF-8000 isn't as well-known because I bet almost no one bought one. And if you did, it's probably in as phenomenally good cosmetic condition as this one is from all the time it spent in a drawer not getting used. I would love to have more to show or say about this thing because it is genuinely novel, but it is so lackluster. And that is the reason I've held off on making a video about it for so long. There's just not much to say about it. This is the only model in the IF line that Casio ever made. It was succeeded by the SF line that cloned the wizard's layout and ditched the touchscreen. Just think, if the IF-8000 had the capabilities of the wizard, we could have had the revelation of the 1997 Palm Pilot a whole decade earlier. All of the pieces were there. Gestures, full resolution touch, software expansion, but no one put them all together. 
There were a number of other true touchscreen devices after this, like the Linus Wright Top in 1988, the Apple Newton and Dauphin DTR1 in 1993, and the 1994 Magic Cap devices, which I have a video about from forever ago if you want to see another truly revolutionary device. For now though, that's all I have to say about the Casio IF8000, a world's first device that no one remembers, and mostly for good reasons. If you enjoyed this video, you may want to subscribe to be notified when I release more. If you want to help support the channel, you can find me on Patreon. But for now, that's it, and I will see you next time.